Hey all, the practitioner here. Um, I wanted to, uh, this video is not, uh, this video is kind of a little in between my uh, Pseudonymous Observer Report videos. Uh, for those of you who have not uh, seen the new series that I'm uh, working on up and running, um, feel free to click in the uh, one of the links below. Um, there will actually be quite a few links uh, to various different things that I'm talking about. Um, but anyway, uh, Pseudonymous Observer Report I will uh, get to in a little bit in this video. Uh, the main reason I was making this particular video is, uh, and the last one where I did a knife review, is uh, I came across a very interesting channel now by the name of Scaligrim. Now, Scaligrim is a former German, uh, then Norwegian, and now Canadian living up in Prince George. Oh, excuse me. Hair in my mouth. Um, downside with the beard, it'll get you every time. Anyway, um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So, anyway, this guy moved to Prince George uh, with his, uh, um, with his, uh, his significant other, uh, probably... About a year ago, maybe a little less. Um, I actually lost track of when he did. But anyway, point being is that um, this guy is a master of historical European martial arts. Uh, in particular, he is uh, he is uh, particularly familiar with broadsword um, or longsword. Um, you know, basically he knows most of the uh, he knows most of the classic European fighting styles. Now, I've been affiliated with uh, I've kind of been loosely affiliated with live action role play games and. Um, and, uh, and some of uh, the Society for Creative Anachronism here in British Columbia. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, it was, uh, it was actually a live-action role-playing game that started my creation of the character Pseudonymous, and as a result, I finally fleshed them out into something that would actually be particularly interesting. Uh, and I'm just continuing on the series, and we'll see where that goes. But anyway, um, the reason for this video... Um, I came across a documentary, which you'll find in the description below. Uh, it's a National Geographic documentary on the making of the katana. Now, I want to make this clear, I am not a katana fanboy. Um, I did take Aikido for about three years, um, and I have trained with a Boken for about for that length of time. But that was years ago. Um, I haven't done anything martial arts related since 2009, maybe? You know, so uh, if you go really far back into the archives of my videos on the YouTube channel, you'll find me doing some, uh, you know, ways to use Aikido to deflect zombies in a zombie attack, like, or how to get out of grapples. Because, again, you know, in a hypothetical zombie attack, zo uh, zombies will attempt to grab you and then bite you. But that's another story altogether. Anyway, all that aside, um, I was watching this documentary, and I came across something that was particularly interesting. Um, they showed me, uh, they, they showed a scene of a... Um, a samurai master, or a claimed samurai master, after an arrow was being fired at him by his daughter, he literally sliced the arrow out of the air with his katana. Now, assuming that the arrows are moving at, oh, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, moving at, at very high speeds or what have you, you know, say, so, you know, say several tens or nearly a hundred miles an hour, uh, you know, um, I'm assuming that that, you know, that maybe that would be kind of like a cool stunt or, you know, even something, you know, either way, uh, of course, the question is whether it could be used in battle or whether it's just a publicity stunt, you know, like a, like a magic trick. I thought it was kind of cool either way. Here's the odd bit. I figured that um, Scaligrim, uh, on a couple of his videos, has pointed out that long swords and katanas are, well, they're not indistinguishable or, in, or completely interchangeable. They are quite similar. Um, the long sword is, in fact, quite sharp, and it's actually relatively mobile uh, in a similar way to the katana, if not in some ways a little bit, well, a little bit superior. Now, assuming that what he says is true, I thought that the um, I thought the ability to uh, um, uh, that even the trick of uh, of chopping an arrow out of the uh, out of the air with a sword, um, I figured that you know some technique like that would not be unique to Japan. Um, it should have developed elsewhere. And as a matter of fact, uh, I did find a reference in China to something similar. Uh, the Jet Li movie Hero a few years ago, which was based on um, a true story about the Emperor Qin who first unified China. Um, and was uh, and, and the story of an assassin who attempted to kill him. In that storyline, they showed, say, 12 people firing arrows at a couple, and the couple used uh, a, a sort of double sword um, scenario, two-handed swords thing, to be able to spin and knock the arrows out of the air. Now, assuming that that wasn't Hollywood cinematic effect, and that was actually based on, uh, that was actually part of the true story on which this movie was based, that would also be kind of a, sem a semi-historical record of that. However, in Europe, I have not been able to find any direct reference to a sword being sliced out of the air by a katana. So I did some thinking about this for a while, and I talked to a uh, I talked to a fellow uh, friend of mine uh, who is a uh, a German uh, who is studying in Japan uh, in university there, and uh, I also took a look at uh, I also tried talking to some other people who were involved in medieval related live action role play or Society for Creative Anachronism. Um, I tried going, and I could not find any references anywhere. 
However, I have come up, I have come across, uh, based on some of their suggestions, a couple of possible reasons as to why there might not be documentation for this in Europe. The reason why we may never actually directly see a longsword chopping a, uh, an arrow out of the air is for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one of which is the fact that the catching of an arrow, um, the, the actual ability to catch an arrow, I should mention, they covered this on Mythbusters and ninjas, you know, and, and it's impossible for a human to catch an arrow flying at full speed. However, uh, apparently there have been stage magicians who have done something similar um, by, using a by using an arrow with a special type of fletching. Apparently, by, uh, by the way, for those of you who are not aware, the fletching is the little uh, feathered bit at the back. Apparently, if you actually, uh, with a certain type of fletching, you can get an arrow to fly only like, you know, uh, you know, only like, say, 90 feet or 100 feet or something like that. And what it does is it can be used for killing birds, but over very short distances. And as a result, it's not... Um, Anyway, this type of fletching, when fired off an arrow, apparently allows the arrow to, um, something about its aerodynamics apparently allows it to slow down quicker, meaning, that, a, meaning that, uh, that even if it's fired at full speed, a magician might actually be able to catch the arrow in midair um, if they're standing far enough away because the arrow has slowed down far enough that it actually is able to be caught by a human. Another possibility, uh, which was brought up to me by my friend who was studying in Japan, um, actually suggests that there might be a more colloquial way as to how this was developed in our culture. Now, I haven't done enough... Now, I should mention, I am not a sports fan, so I'm not actually sure about the background of this. You know what? Actually, let me just pull it up now. Uh, just to be on the safe side, I'm actually going to pull up the Wikipedia article on baseball to see whether or not the development might actually have a historical reference to this. Well, let's just pull it up for the hell of it. Uh, history. Origins of baseball. Uh, the origins of baseball, um, okay, so Alexander Cartwright was the founder of the modern baseball team. But apparently, uh, the, apparently a French manuscript, uh, um, uh, apparently, uh, um, apparently uh, a manuscript uh, goes back as far as 1344 with monks playing a similar game to baseball, um, uh, known as, uh, uh, known as uh, uh, possibly La Seule, um, uh, or um, in other old French games, uh, um, uh, there is Le Ballo au Baton, et Le Ball Empoissonné, um, uh, but the thing is that the, sen the consensus is that, uh, the, uh, um, uh, well, today's baseball is, an, um, anyway, um, anyway, apparently it might have been uh, originally developed in North America, but there is, but uh, what's interesting is the fact that apparently um, the game may have originated in England, um, uh, and that apparently rounders in early baseball were actually variants of the uh, 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 rounders, uh, um, um, uh, which, was a, uh, which was an old uh, British, uh, uh, an old British game. Um, and baseball may have been variants of each other, and the game may have, uh, may have had antecedents uh, in the games of uh, in the games of stool ball, uh, uh, stool ball, and tut ball. And uh, cricket may also have been descended uh, from such games, but uh, again, uh, there may have been imports uh, from Flanders. The key point is, is that apparently there actually is a wide range of history um, going on, but these games were all involving um, uh, were involving uh, balls, and um, you know were involving balls and bats. So it is possible that maybe the reason why we never actually saw the arrow being hit out of the air with a sword is, um, or maybe, you know, maybe because of these old games, maybe what might have happened is somebody came up with this particular idea for the special fletching thing, or, you know, did this stunt once, and rather than it being documented, some monk might have said, hey, this might actually be more fun as a, as a ball, as a game, and hence why uh, the, the version of baseball that we know today may have actually evolved from a similar source, um, and maybe the reason why we don't have documentation of this uh, uh, chopping arrows out of the air with a sword um, by Western European swordsmen is simply because of the fact that instead uh, the focus kind of went into things like baseball instead. So that may have been the, the counterpart analogy in the Western world as um, uh, maybe, maybe the development of that was the development in the Western world of what, uh, of what the, uh, the effect of chopping, the, uh, chopping an arrow out of the air with a katana happened in the Eastern world. Um, alternatively, there is one other possible explanation for this. Um, bear in mind that uh, throughout the period of the uh, throughout the period when samurai became um, particularly uh, uh, powerful in, uh, in in Japanese history, uh, especially prior to the engagement of the shogunate, um, samurai were considered to be the elites of their day, as this video uh, points out. One of the things this video documentary does not point out, however, is the fact that, uh, that, uh, that samurai were also trained in various things like calligraphy. Um, there was even a, a tradition where, um, where a, uh, a samurai was actually supposed to create a, a death haiku. 
Uh, so this way, if they were ever uh, forced to commit seppuku, uh, they would actually be required to recite their death haiku in front of people and then disembowel themselves. And uh, you know, there, and, and part of the reason why uh, it would be done in front of witnesses is so this way there would be a documentation of how well you died, um, how honorable a person you were. In other words, part of the actual training of the samurai culture was literacy. So as such, because there were a lot more literate people, well, maybe not necessarily a lot more literate people in Japan, but because of the fact that record-taking, particularly with regard to samurai feats, was, consi was um, a lot more thorough in Japan than, uh, than say, uh, writing about individual warriors in Western cultures, there, the, rest of the, the references to incidents of this sort, and part of the reason why the tradition may have been passed down in Japan, is because of the fact that, um, again, there may have been a much greater writing system um, and a much greater number of people amongst the ruling class who could write in Japan and China than there than there were in uh, than there were in the Western world. Um, another example of this is that well, China, uh, Japan learned in both its uh, both uh, parts of its fighting styles and parts of its uh, of its culture from China. Um, example by the Japanese adoption of junks as opposed to uh, you know uh, which they got from the Chinese and other things like that. But the key point is though is that again um, or even just kanji you know uh, kanji being spread from China to Japan. With this in mind, the key point is, though, is that um, because of the fact that if you take a look as well at the Chinese system of, uh, of bureaucracy, bureaucracy was much more, um, uh, bureaucracy and, and, and ruling classes were much more, uh, you know, the ruling class was much more of a bureaucratic system than it was a, uh, you know, with full basis uh, with, with, you know, and one of the aspects of bureaucracy is writing. So as such, China had a much more developed civil service than the Western powers did. And um, as a result, um, you know, most people in Western Europe at the time of the 13th century or what have you, uh, most people could not read. Mo there were a, a very sizable amount of the noble population who could not read. And as a result, they would rely on um, priests and monks and other people to act as record keepers for them rather than learning to read themselves. Um, so with that in mind, it is possible. There so there's a couple of reasons in summation as to why we never, saw why we never see any records um, or even modern day practices of uh, someone uh, in, in mod uh, you know, with a long sword chopping an arrow out of the air. Um, the issue may be a combination of lack of record keeping and the possibility that something more practical may have developed, i.e. in the form of baseball. There is, now, that all being aside, um, I'd like to move to another issue, which is the, uh, the issue of practicality. Um, now, assuming even assuming that the arrows that were shot at this uh, samurai were actually legitimate arrows without any specialized improved fletching or anything, just, just even for uh, the sake of argument, assuming that these were not specially prepped arrows and these were actual real arrows, and that this was a real training sam uh, samurai training regimen back in the day when samurai ruled Japan. There is a fatal... Uh, realistically speaking, even if... Um, even if this were usable uh, as a training mechanism to, you know, to learn how to control your sword better, and even if this uh, could work against, say, one or two or even three archers, this would not work in a battle situation. Uh, neither would it work, in, and, and this would, um, and th like I said, this would not work in a battle situation either in Europe or in Japan, uh, and here's why. Normally... Um, like I said, the, the training for this is that uh, if you look at any situation where, he, where a samurai, uh, as in with this video, where a samurai chops an arrow out of the air, the arrow is, fired, is being fired straight at him at a level field. As such, it means that, you know, he can see the arrow coming, you know, he can see the arrow coming, uh, and if he steps off to the side, or if he's even off to the side already, he can, you know, he can swing his sword around because of the fact that it's following one single track, so he can have a reasonable chance of, uh, especially after years of training, of being able to predict where the arrow is going to be so he knows where to strike his sword. Most archers, when they fire on the battlefield, they fire using longbows, they, uh, or, or uh, you know, uh, short, medium, or longbows. They fire in groups. They generally fire hundreds of arrows at a time, and they fire at an arc. They fire at an arc of, uh, okay, well, um, I wish I had a, uh, a screen share right now, but since I don't have it with the recording thing, I'll do it in Google Plus later. They would normally fire at an angle, generally between 20, 35 degrees, that kind of thing, you know. But the point is that because they are firing in an arc, in order to be able to get, a, uh, in order to be able to get farther range, samurai, um, you know, samurai would be, uh, in, in a battlefield scenario, um, if they were on the battlefield, they would be being attacked by large groups of archers, and, uh, and, and, and arrows would be flying at them by the hundreds. And even if they were that good that they could, say, cut an arrow, like, even, if they, even if they were a super 
samurai master who was so well trained with his sword that they could cut a couple of arrows out of the air at that angle, they wouldn't be able to cut them all out. So as such, um, cutting arrows out of the air with a, with a sword just isn't that practical on the battlefield. That's the reason why, for the Europeans, um, even with those who had the long sword, there would still be development of things like the shield, um, there would be shield formations. Uh, the Romans developed an entire uh, focus known as the tortoise technique, um, which, um, which, uh, which uh, cohorts would use, um, uh, cohorts and legions would use. Um, they would have a group of shields uh, moving off to the front, the sides, and the back, and then the people in the middle would have their shields up topwards. And what this would do is it would actually block the arrow fire coming down from large groups of archers. This created a, a sort of um, this created a much greater protection for the Roman legion, and as such, they would be able to fight as a uh, as a more effective fighting unit over a longer period of time, uh, or that they would at least receive less casualties in the battlefield. Anyway, all of this being aside, because of these reasons, um, it is more understandable now that we this is uh, I guess this would all, all be the reason as to why we saw this development of this particular technique in Japan, but not in the Western world. I kind of get the feeling that maybe the Westerners actually had a more practical, um, you know, maybe with the development of the katana, etc., it was all well and good, you know, as, as part of a, a sort of a status thing and as part of a, uh, you know, as part of a, a rigorous code of how to, you know, establish a sort of feudal society, you know, maybe it worked for Japan. But on the other hand, um, because swordsmen were far more common um, in the Western world and long swords were, were used by far more people, Shield for and, and swords in general were used by far more people, uh, far greater numbers of people. Um, shield tactics, um, especially when working as a group, were found to be far more effective, and hence why we probably uh, that's probably one of the that coupled with baseball uh, origins, coupled with lack of rec of record keeping. Um, you know, uh, record keeping being nowhere as extensive as it was in China and Japan, is probably these are probably the three reasons why we don't see any record of. A, 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 a sword master from Europe slicing an arrow out of the air with a, a slicing an arrow out of the air with his sword. It just never evolved because of the fact that, uh, or if it did evolve, it was quickly abandoned, uh, simply because of the fact that it wasn't practical on the battlefield, and um, you know the record keeping levels were not uh, were not that advanced. So this is not to say uh, this is to say that rather than the ability um, that even though uh, a samurai master could slice an arrow out of the uh, out of the air with his sword, this does not make the katana superior to the long sword. As a matter of fact, overall, it it kind of creates the impression that the European knights might have actually have been onto something, may have actually been a bit more practical in terms of uh, fighting the battlefield. Um, this might be illustrated in one particular different form. Knights and nobles and stuff like that, uh, and other swords people in Europe, would have wanted to stay alive longer to be able to fight more battles and the like. I mean, yes, there was that death and glory thing, but the point is that you would always be wanting to, you know, you would always be wanting to try to help out your, your group as much as possible, and, you know, if you could survive longer, that would be great. In Japan, the emphasis on Bushido was always that you were ready for your death, and that you would try to die in the best, um, in the most glorious and most honorable way possible. So as such, um, the system was radically different, and um, in terms of practicality on the battlefield, in terms of troops and multiple arrows firing, you would be more willing to go down fighting rather than trying to defend yourself from a large uh, a group of uh, a group of arrows. Uh, it's not that one is worse than the other; it's just a radically different cultural, uh, a really different, a radically different cultural milieu. So anyway, uh, that's kind of my analysis on all this. Um, I will be giving a shout out uh, again to Scalagram. Uh, he is the um, uh, 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 his YouTube channel is really great, especially for, uh, you know, uh, he, uh, he does have some good political ideas. Um, I will admit that my versions of, of, you know, my versions are a bit more socially... Well, anyway, I won't get into that right now. But yeah, I mean, he does have some interesting ideas. Um, even if his political views may differ from mine a little, uh, a bit, um, I still I still think that he's very interesting to listen to and does have some interesting ideas. Um, but, in, and, uh, and with regard to his sword work and his martial arts ideas, um, he is amongst uh, some of the top people on YouTube in terms of expertise in this area. So if you are interested in learning about uh, historical European martial arts um, or practicality of, um, of, of weapons use and even some uh, interesting weapons philosophy, I recommend watching his channel and possibly even send him a message if you're interested. That's my thoughts. Um, so yeah, signing off now.